Between 1900 and 1922, Ireland underwent a transformative period of political and social upheaval, culminating in the establishment of the Irish Free State. This era witnessed the intense struggle for home rule, the Ulster Crisis, the dramatic events of the Easter Rising, the Irish War of Independence, and the bitter divisions of the Irish Civil War. This essay examines these key events and their significance in shaping the trajectory of Irish history, ultimately leading to the partial independence of Ireland in 1922. At the turn of the 20th century, Ireland was part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and its affairs were controlled by the British Parliament in Westminster. The Home Rule movement, which had been active since the late 19th century, sought to achieve self-government for Ireland within the United Kingdom. Irish nationalists, primarily represented by the Irish Parliamentary Party IPP, led by John Redmond, campaigned for a Home Rule bill that would establish an Irish Parliament in Dublin to manage domestic affairs, while remaining under the British Crown. The first two Home Rule bills, introduced in 1886 and 1893, had been defeated. However, political changes in Britain by the early 1900s provided a renewed opportunity. The third Home Rule Bill was introduced in 1912 and passed by the House of Commons, largely thanks to the Liberal Party's reliance on Irish nationalist support. However, the bill faced stiff opposition from the Unionists, predominantly Protestants in the north of Ireland, who were determined to remain part of the United Kingdom and feared that Home Rule would place them under the control of a Catholic-majority Dublin Parliament. The Ulster Unionists, led by figures such as Edward Carson and James Craig, vehemently opposed Home Rule. They feared that a Catholic-dominated government in Dublin would threaten their economic and political interests and undermine their cultural identity as British subjects. The Unionist slogan Home Rule is Rome Rule encapsulated their belief that Catholic influence would dominate a self-governing Ireland. In response to the passing of the Third Home Rule Bill, Unionists organized mass protests and formed the Ulster Volunteer Force UVF, in 1913, a paramilitary organization committed to resisting home rule by force if necessary. This move escalated tensions in Ireland and led to a significant militarization of the conflict. Meanwhile, Irish nationalists, alarmed by the UVF, formed their own paramilitary organization, the Irish Volunteers, to ensure the passage and implementation of home rule. By 1914, Ireland was on the brink of civil war, with two armed factions poised to fight over home rule. However, the outbreak of World War I in August 1914 delayed the implementation of home rule. Both the Unionist and Nationalist leaders agreed to a temporary suspension of the issue until after the war. This postponement marked the beginning of a crucial shift in Irish politics, as more radical voices emerged to challenge the IPP's moderate approach to Irish independence. With the onset of World War I, John Redmond and the Irish Parliamentary Party supported the British war effort, believing that Irish participation in the war would secure goodwill and ensure the eventual implementation of home rule. Redmond urged the Irish volunteers to enlist in the British Army, and many did, especially those who hoped that Irish sacrifices would earn political rewards. Over 200,000 Irishmen served in the British Army during the war, and many paid the ultimate price. However, not all Irish nationalists supported Redmond's call. A minority faction within the Irish Volunteers, led by more radical nationalists, refused to fight for Britain. They saw the war as an opportunity to push for complete independence rather than settle for home rule. This group would later play a key role in the Easter Rising, marking a radical departure from the more moderate nationalist path of Redmond's IPP. The most dramatic event in early 20th century Irish history was the Easter Rising of April 1916. While Britain was preoccupied with World War I, a small group of Irish Republicans, led by Patrick Pearce, James Connolly and others, staged an armed rebellion in Dublin with the aim of establishing an independent Irish Republic. The rebels, numbering around 1,500, seized key buildings in the city, 
including the General Post Office GPO, where Pierce read aloud the proclamation of the Irish Republic, declaring Ireland independent from British rule. The rising was poorly planned and executed, and it lacked broad support from the Irish public, who initially viewed it as reckless. However, the British response to the rebellion was brutal. After six days of fighting, the rebels surrendered, and British authorities executed the leaders, including Pierce, Connolly, and Thomas Clark. These executions had a profound impact on Irish public opinion, shifting sympathy towards the cause of Irish independence. What had started as a failed uprising transformed into a powerful symbol of resistance and martyrdom, and the leaders of the rising became revered as national heroes. In the aftermath of the Easter Rising, the political landscape in Ireland changed dramatically. Sinn Féin, a political party that had initially been associated with a moderate nationalist agenda, was incorrectly blamed for the Rising. However, under the leadership of Eamon de Valera, who had survived the Rising, Sinn Féin adopted a more radical Republican platform, advocating for full Irish independence from Britain. By 1917, Sinn Féin had become the dominant force in Irish nationalist politics, overshadowing John Redmond's Irish Parliamentary Party. In the 1918 general election, Sinn Féin won a landslide victory, capturing 73 out of 105 Irish seats in Westminster. Instead of taking their seats in the British Parliament, Sinn Féin MPs established the first Dale Aaron in January 1919, a revolutionary parliament that declared Ireland's independence and set about creating a parallel government. At the same time, the Irish volunteers rebranded themselves as the Irish Republican Army IRA, and launched a guerrilla campaign against British rule. The Irish War of Independence had begun. The Irish War of Independence, also known as the Anglo-Irish War, was fought between the IRA and British forces from January 1919 to July 1921. The IRA, under the leadership of figures like Michael Collins, adopted guerrilla tactics, targeting British police stations, military installations, and government offices. The war was marked by ambushes, assassinations, and reprisals, with both sides committing acts of violence against civilians. The British response to the insurgency included the deployment of the notorious Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries, paramilitary forces composed of British World War I veterans who were infamous for their brutal tactics. Their indiscriminate violence against civilians, including the burning of Cork and the Croke Park Massacre on Bloody Sunday, November 21, 1920, where British forces opened fire on a crowd of spectators at a football match, further alienated the Irish public and increased support for the Republican cause. Despite the violence, neither side could achieve a decisive victory, and by 1921 both the British government and the Irish Republicans were ready to negotiate. A truce was declared in July 1921, leading to formal negotiations between British and Irish representatives. The negotiations between the British government, led by Prime Minister David Lloyd George, and the Irish delegation, which included Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith, resulted in the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December 1921. The treaty established the Irish Free State, a self-governing dominion within the British Commonwealth, with its own parliament and government. However, the treaty also included provisions that allowed Northern Ireland to opt out of the Free State, which it did, leading to the partition of Ireland. The treaty was a compromise, offering Ireland significant autonomy but not the full republic that many had fought for. Crucially, it required members of the Irish Parliament to swear an oath of allegiance to the British Crown, a contentious issue that would divide Irish nationalists. The Anglo-Irish Treaty sparked deep divisions within the nationalist movement. Pro-treaty forces, led by Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith, believed the treaty was the best possible outcome and a stepping stone to full independence. Anti-treaty forces, led by Eamon de Valera, rejected the treaty, arguing that it betrayed the Republican ideals of full sovereignty and independence. These divisions led to the Irish Civil War, June 1922 to May 1923. The pro-treaty forces, backed by the newly established Irish Free State and its National Army, fought against the anti-treaty IRA. The Civil War was brutal, with both sides committing atrocities, 
and it left a lasting legacy of bitterness and division in Irish society. Michael Collins, one of the key architects of the treaty, was assassinated by anti-treaty forces in August 1922, a major blow to the pro-treaty side. However, by May 1923, the anti-treaty forces, weakened and demoralized, agreed to a ceasefire, effectively ending the civil war. The period between 1900 and 1922 was one of profound transformation in Ireland. The quest for home rule gradually evolved into a demand for full independence, spurred by the radicalization of Irish politics during World War I and the Easter Rising. The War of Independence and the subsequent civil war resulted in the establishment of the Irish Free State, a significant but incomplete realization of Irish nationalist aspirations. The partition of Ireland and the creation of Northern Ireland ensured that the question of Irish unity would continue to shape Irish politics for the rest of the 20th century. Nonetheless, by 1922, Ireland had taken a decisive step towards self-governance, marking the end of centuries of direct British rule and the beginning of a new chapter in its national history. Thank you for watching this deep dive into Ireland's journey to independence. We hope this video shed light on the pivotal events that shaped the nation between 1900 and 1922. Your support means the world to us, and we're grateful you took the time to explore this important chapter in Irish history with us. If you found this video informative, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content on Irish history, myths, and legends. We'd love to hear your thoughts so feel free to leave a comment below. Thanks again and see you in the next episode.